Believe it or not, when I got to the end of the MG alphabet, there was one glaring omission, and that was the TF. I hadn't gathered up enough video of TFs, I guess because I'm a TF guy myself, I didn't pay much attention, and I got to the end and there was no video. So I've decided the only thing to do is to show you my TF, or TFs as it were, the place to start talking about TF is to tell you that this car owes its very existence to the Austin Healey 100. Now here's how that story goes. In 1952, the TD was getting kind of old and MG went to the new corporate owners, BMC, British Motors Corporation, to ask them if they could launch their new MGA. It had been prototyped, raced, it had been wind tunnel tested, it had been almost, it's ready to go. But BMC, having the Austin Healey 100, a four-cylinder, two-seater, nice streamlined sports car, they didn't want it a competition with another streamlined four-cylinder car. So they said, go back and redesign or face, give a facelift to the TD. <clears throat> well, they did. They went back to the factory. And this is the, my favorite part of the story. The guys down in the metal bending shop started banging out the fenders. They raised the fenders. They started putting the sheet metal together. They lowered the bonnet, raked. And then they put some streamlining on a fa false radiator shell. They fared in the headlights into the, these new front wings, sort of a la Jaguar, and gave it a very, well, more streamlined look. MG's developer of experimental models, Alec Hounslow, said that he, Cecil Cousins, a couple of foremen, and a tin basher named Billy Wilkins, literally handmade the first TF in a fortnight in the company shop. He said that Billy Wilkins beat out the TF's front wings from a flat paddle of metal. They presented their creation to John Thornley outside his office, and then the guys from the drawing office upstairs came down and drew it up. It took them six months, and of course, it was met with derision, like all MG models were, and someone said it looked like a TD that had been kicked in the face. Well, after all these years at least, most MG aficionados, Malcolm Green among others, has said that this is probably the prettiest MG ever to come out of the Abingdon factory, and I sort of agree with them on that. When those panel beaters down in the shop got around to addressing the rear of the car, they wanted to keep that aerodynamic styling going, so they took the slab gas tank, which is very similar to the one on the TD, but they sloped it more and sloped it down to the, where they put a wider apron on down here and sloped the spare tire the same amount to keep that nice aerodynamic theme going. But what you'll notice is we now have out of the factory the option of wire wheels on the TF, which really added that extra mystique from the old TC, the wire wheels that was lost on the TD. We now have it back, adding that element of beauty to the TF. The dashboard was completely redesigned from the TD 
which was sort of haphazard. They, MG recognized that they were going to sell a lot of these cars in America. And so we now have a nice symmetrical, balanced layout. We've got two glove boxes. Everything here is in the center panel. These instruments can easily be switched. The steering wheel can easily fit over here. And we now have a switchable from left hand to the right hand drive. So it made it very easy for them to come up and uh, have different uh, models for, for export and for home use in, in England. So it made a very pretty layout, very nice, balanced, symmetrical layout. This TF is a 1250, meaning it has a 1250cc engine, as opposed to later ones, the last year of production, they offered a 1500cc engine. The way you can tell the difference is, this one doesn't have a nice little badge here that says 1500, so it's a 1250. Most of these cars, there was 9600 TFs produced total, 6,200 of them were 1250s, and 3,400 of them were 1500s. Now this, this car has been my driver. It was never completely frame up or restored. It was what you'd call a rolling restoration. I just did things as I went along and kept it on the road. So it's been a driver, and uh, it's been a very very reliable driver. If you look inside here, inside the bonnet, under the bonnet, inside the engine bay, it shows an engine that's almost identical to the TD engine, uh, especially the Mark II. Now if we open up this side of the engine bay, you'll see the engine, like I said, is basically the TD Mark II with a larger inch and a half carburetors that was a standard on the Mark II. But something is different in this part of the engine bay. Well, notice we've got a wiper motor down here where it used to be mounted up here on the TD. They've moved it down here. Well, something else is missing. What's happened to the old fuel pump that used to be mounted right here? So they moved the fuel pump back here in front of the right rear wheel in a difficult place to get to. It's a high pressure fuel pump because it has to pump it a lot further to get up front. These things were always pesky and had points sticking and you had needed to get to it. You can't get to this one. They solved that problem by putting a trap door in the bottom of the side curtain compartment. Remove a few screws and you can get to it from the top. This car has an electronic fuel pump. It looks the same, works the same, sounds the same, but doesn't have those pesky points. It's electronic. When I told you this was my driver, here's a little illustration perhaps of what I was talking about. These badges are here for a purpose. They're not just for decoration. This is the badge of the National Tea Register Club. And the Tea Register and the Ohio Register, they've always encouraged us to drive these cars, use them, have fun. And to that end, over the years, they've sponsored road trips. This one was the granddaddy of them all, was the Circuit of Britain in 1990, where we took 89 cars over to England and we drove them around England and Scotland. And in that case, uh, we covered 1,981 miles in England and Scotland, plus you had to get back and forth to the East Coast. <clears throat> the next year we did Maritime Meander, 1991, 
which took us 1,897 miles around Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick. After that, we did the run around the rock, which was 1,900 miles around Newfoundland. And then, of course, you had to get home from there. It took me 1,700 miles to get home. So you can see these cars can take it. These cars can make long trips. The only question today is, can our old bodies take it? But these cars are very reliable, and we took them on a lot of long trips very successfully. So the engine bay on this car looks pretty typical of a T-type driver. Clean and neat, but pales when compared to an accurate and complete restoration. This is my other TF, a 1500. I have just completed a frame-up total restoration. Many of the parts in this car are new, starting with a new wood frame body tub that was built in England. You're wondering what a frame-up restoration looks like? Well, it might look something like this. Increasing displacement from 1250 to 1500 cc's, increased acceleration, and added 10 miles per hour to the top end. To increase the diameter of the cylinders by 5.5 millimeters required a new block casting. The resulting new engine was designated the XPEG. The 1250 had been called the XPAG. Since not enough new blocks could be produced to meet the demand, both 1250 and 1500 TFs were built simultaneously during the final year of production. This causes some confusion in the MG community. Outwardly, they look the same. The engines look the same, and they're both beloved by MG enthusiasts as the final incarnation of Cecil Kimber's vision, the last of the square riggers.